Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to be talking about the history of archaeology. We're going to look at how and why it began, how it's evolved, and where it's at today. What most people think of as archaeology is something that's obviously very heavily shaped by movies and media, <coughs> Indiana Jones, <coughs> and is actually quite inaccurate. I also think people have this impression that archaeologists today do things in exactly the same way as archaeologists of yore back in the early 1900s and late 1800s, which is definitely not true. Before we begin, don't forget to show your support and subscribe to the channel, hitting the bell button so that you get notifications every time I put out new videos. I also have a brand new shiny Instagram for you guys to follow me at rachelauman.digs, which is going to be linked here and in the description box below. Okay, let's dig in. I want to establish first off that people having an interest in the past in material culture is not something that's like relatively recent. It is something that we can actually say demonstrated throughout the history of civilization. We have been excavating sites and studying history for pretty much as long as we have been around. The world's first ever archaeologist is considered to be someone called King Nabonidus of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. He ruled around 550 BCE, so that's roughly about 2,500 years ago. And while he was king, he ran some excavations, which ended up discovering foundation deposits that dated to the Akkadian Empire, which happened about 4,000 years ago. So it was about 1,500 years before his time. And he had these artifacts studied. He also showed quite an interest in history throughout his reign. And we know all of this because he published his research on a cuneiform cylinder seal that you can see in a museum today. We also have records from the Song Dynasty in China from about 700 years ago, where Neo-Confucian scholar officials would excavate and record catalogs ancient artifacts from previous dynasties that then went on to kind of like revive the use of these ancient relics within their like state rituals. Obviously these are just two examples but pretty clearly demonstrates that this is not something that's like just unique to kind of like more modern times. That being said what we generally consider to be modern archaeology got its start during the a period of history called antiquarianism and we usually refer to those kinds of archaeologists as antiquarian archaeologists. If you're struggling to remember that, you could also kind of think of this period as the rich white kid hobby era. <laughs> it was kind of regarded by scholars as an amateur pastime, and it was enabled by the kind of colonial period of history, specifically the British Empire, which allowed rich white people with lots of money to go off to lots of different foreign places, unearth their treasures, and then bring them back home to study. Antiquarianism very much focused on facts and empirical evidence. What kind of kicked off the whole thing was this kind of rediscovery of ancient Greek and Roman texts, which kind of kicked off the Renaissance. At this time, it was the popular thing for like nobles and elites and stuff like that to have extensive art collections that of ancient Roman and Greek art. And as at that time, there was only a finite amount they then sponsored excavations to go off and find some more art for their collection. Another factor that contributed to this was the invasion of Egypt by Napoleon in 1798. During this campaign, Napoleon actually brought with him 175 like experts and scholars to study Egypt and its ancient past. As a result of this study, a big book was published and this plus the translation of the Rosetta Stone, which was also found during that campaign, it kind of added ancient Egypt as a place to like study and collect artifacts from along with Greece and Rome. One of the first sites that was ever actually excavated in England was Stonehenge. This was done in 1978 by William Cunnington. He is kind of considered to be the pioneer of the method of archaeological excavation. Before that people still did lots of like surveys and studies and drawings and some digging of places but he is the guy that kind of like solidified it into a thing. Again around this time of 
like the late 1700s and the early 1800s, the cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum were also excavated. And this partly was spurred on by the fact that the Queen of Naples at the time wanted to add some ancient statues to her art collection. <laughs> As we move on into the 1800s, we see a lot of advances being made. So one of the biggest ones being the inclusion of the concept of stratigraphy, which we borrowed from geology. The idea of stratigraphy is that you have all of these overlapping layers of rock and soil that if you can kind of decipher the order in which they happen, it allows you to basically trace back successive periods in time. The first written occurrence of the word archaeologist happens in the Oxford English Dictionary in 1824. So one once things started, the ball just like kept on rolling and getting a lot bigger and we see this big boom in interest in archaeology and archaeological activity. And we then start seeing a lot of really famous sites that you have probably heard of and famous archaeologists that you have probably heard of starting to crop up, all in particular known for the fact that they are just basically very attentive to detail and they insist on recording everything, which is definitely something that modern archaeologists still do to this day. First mention is going to be Augustus Pitt Rivers, who began excavating on his own land in the 1880s. One of the things he's most famous for is the fact that he would arrange his artifacts by typology and chronology, which kind of helped us revolutionize how we date things because it highlighted the evolutionary trends that we have for items. So it allowed us to do a lot more secure dating of things. He's also known for the fact that he insisted that everything coming out of the ground should be catalogued and recorded, not just the shiny gold pretty things that would look nice on your mantelpiece. Around this period we also have the very famous William Flinders Petrie, who is the kind of progenitor of Egyptology, which in itself is kind of a whole branch of archaeology. Like Pitt Rivers, he's known for the fact that he was excellent and very particular about recording. He was the first person to scientifically investigate the Great Pyramid of Khufu at Giza, and he's also known for the fact that he trained and mentored the next generation of archaeologists like Howard Carter. Like I said, at this point, like, archaeology was like, you know, in fashion, so you had a lot of people going off to try and excavate sites or rediscover ancient sites, particularly things that are like mentioned in the Bible or historical texts. That's where you get the site of Hisarlik, which is also known by its better name of Troy. That was excavated by Heinrich Schliemann. He also did excavations in Greece of Mycenae. You also have the Palace of Knossos in Crete by Sir Arthur Evans, which was excavated in the early 1900s. So you just have all of these really famous sites that you probably have heard of start getting excavated at this point in time, which is really interesting because I I mean, all of these archaeologists, I'm not trying to slam them, but can you imagine if we were able to discover those sites in modern day with all the techniques that we had? Because as we know, archaeology is a bit of a destructive process. You can't put things back to like the way that they were. So there's actually probably a lot of information that we've lost by having those sites be discovered so early, which is not to say that it's necessarily a bad thing, but it is something that I sometimes think about, about like, you know, what if we discovered Troy today and it was like virtually untouched and we could go in with all of our modern techniques like how much more would we learn it's kind of insane to think about all the information that went missing during this kind of like experimental phase of archaeology where we were still figuring out what to do in the early 1900s we see the transition of archaeology from something that's primarily a hobby into something that is a profession primarily driven by universities hiring professors and offering courses on archaeology as a subject which is something that is driven by all of the public interest in archaeology at that time. This interest was obviously generated by the sites I've already mentioned, but also by the couple really big discoveries in the early 1900s, such as Howard Carter finding the tomb of Tutankhamun in 1922 in the Valley of the Kings, and also the discovery of the Royal Cemetery at Ur in Mesopotamia, modern day Iraq, by Leonard and Catherine Woolley in 1926. During the 1920s and 30s, someone called Sir Mortimer Wheeler, you may have heard of him, did a lot of work in furthering methods of excavation. Particularly, he is known for developing the method of grid excavation, which I myself have used on sites. This was a method that was further developed and refined by his student Kathleen Kenyon, who is very famous for excavating the city of Jericho. During the 1940s and World War II, a lot of archaeological excavations obviously came to a halt, but we do see a really 
I want to say interesting, but also kind of like disturbing <laughs> trend of using archaeology as a part of propaganda and to further political agendas and ideas. So for example, the Nazis tried to use archaeological data to try and prove their racial supremacy of the Aryans. At this point in time, archaeology was really heavily influenced by like the discipline of anthropology and this idea of an ethnicity, and there were a lot of attempts to try and connect old civilizations to modern ones and see what connections were still there. However, this period was kind of short-lived and very decisively ended by the invention of radiocarbon dating in 1949 by Willard Libby. It's also known as C14 dating, I'm sure you've heard of it. The advent of this basically led to a bigger integration of the hard sciences and the scientific method into archaeology and archaeological interpretation. C14 dating is really important because it allowed us to securely assign dates to archaeological assemblages, which led to some of our previous interpretations being completely upended when we discovered that they were wrong and that the entire collections had to be reassessed based on this new information. We also see the introduction of other technologies like geophysical survey and LIDAR technology, which were actually interestingly initially developed as like wartime warfare technologies, but then after the war got integrated into being used into archaeology. All of this helped us further expand the picture that we can paint about the past. At this point we also began to recognize the inherent bias that everyone has when it comes to interpreting a collection and began to make steps about what we needed to do to kind of address that bias so that our findings were as scientifically accurate as possible. Post World War II and in and the latter half of the 19th century, you also start to see this change in thinking of archaeology as something to be like kind of exploited and owned as something that needed to kind of be preserved and rescued, especially in the advent of all the rebuilding that had to happen in Western Europe after all the bombing of World War II. So as towns were rebuilt in the 50s and 60s, we start to see organizations being set up to try and excavate areas before they're about to be destroyed by construction for new buildings. This is a system that largely relied on the goodwill of the developer being happy to kind of pause what they were doing and allow people to come and excavate, and at this time the team were mostly staffed by like volunteers and students led by a trained archaeologist, which is obviously not an ideal situation. It became apparent quite quickly that they just couldn't keep up with the amount of stuff that was going on. And so there began to be a campaign of pressure on governments and other bodies to try and protect heritage by subsidizing and supporting archaeological excavations. This has been a relatively successful campaign, especially in the West as we have seen protection of archaeological ha assets be written into the law. For example, in 1990, the UK government launched the Planning Policies Guidance Notes 16, which kind of took a lot of this campaigning and enshrined it in this idea of what we call either polluter pays or developer pays. If you want to build something, you have to pay for the archaeology to be done. And the onus isn't on the government or a, an external body to provide funding, it's on the developer. This has led directly to the creation of commercial slash contract slash professional archaeological companies and archaeologists in the UK. There are now over 6,000 of us living and working here and conducting projects all across the country. This kind of work is directly responsible for the majority of archaeological discoveries being made in the UK at present. It is a similar case in the US, Canada, and other parts of Europe and other countries all over the world, but obviously it's not all done the same way. If you are an archaeologist that works in an academic setting, so like teaching and publishing and doing research, you now actually have to apply for permits to go into foreign countries and conduct your excavations. It's no longer a case of you can just basically walk in whatever you want, dig up a bunch of stuff and then cart it home for your own museum. There's a lot more clarity about that artifacts dug up in a specific place 
belong to that country. They don't belong to the person who dug them up. In the past decade or so, there's also been a lot more of a movement to encourage local communities to get involved in their own heritage, be that an archeological excavation or whatever, as well as more and more involvement from the hard sciences. And you see lots more technology coming in like stable isotopes, ancient DNA. Archaeologists have come a very long way from where we started, just like the rest of humanity, and we are constantly discovering new things about the past. Given how new technologies are constantly giving us new perspectives on stuff that we thought we already knew everything about, I think it's safe to say that there's not really a danger that we're going to be running out of any archaeology or any ancient stuff to study anytime soon. Okay, that's everything for today, guys. I hope you've enjoyed this video and learned something new as per usual. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please put them down below and I will do my best to answer them. If you enjoyed this video, give me a thumbs up. If you would like to see more from me, please subscribe. As I said at the beginning, I've started a nice new Instagram that's got lots of new content that I've not featured on the channel before. Follow me on Instagram at rachelalman.digs for lots of exciting and cool content. Thank you so much for watching guys and I'll see you next time. Bye!